Um, it is my great privilege to have uh, Professor Rodney Hero here with us today. I'm realizing I left the slide over there. I think I can do it. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Rodney now for over 15 years, if you can believe that. <laughs> probably neither of us should probably acknowledge yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. Um, he is a professor here in political science and also chair of the Democracy and Diversity Cluster within the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society, which is a mouthful. HIFIS, are we calling it HIFIS? Oh, HIFIS. HIFIS, okay. Um, he previously taught at Notre Dame and the University of Colorado Boulder, received his PhD in political science from Purdue University, is the author, if I counted correctly, and I may have missed one, this is your seventh book, is that correct? It's a lot. How about more? <laughs> if we say more than five, I think that's 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 probably enough for, for most of us. Um, his first book uh, received the, uh, the Ralph Bunch Award, which is the highest award the American Political Science Association gives for work um, on race. Um, his book, Faces of Inequality, also won the Woodrow Wilson Award, which is arguably the highest award we give to work in American politics. He, his work uh, focuses on American democracy with an emphasis on Latino politics, state and local politics, and issues of federalism. And we're excited to hear about his latest work looking at black and Latino relations in uh, US national politics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that very generous, overly generous introduction. Uh, thank you all for being here. I, I, I really appreciate your being here. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy it and, and find something interesting in terms of what I'm saying today. So again, thank you uh, for coming. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a, a book project that was recently, well, it was completed a while back. It came out as a book uh, just uh, recently. The title of the book is Black Latino Relations in U.S. National Politics Beyond Conflict or Cooperation. And uh, I am not the sole author, it is the, the uh, co-author is Robert Croyce. Uh, who's at the Metropolitan, Metropolitan State University at Denver, a former graduate student of mine who I've uh, done quite a bit of work with. Before I turn to the rest of my discussion, I guess I want to emphasize something uh, in terms of uh, the title of the book. The, in many ways, it's important to note that the title is, and the focus of the book is Black Latino Relations in U.S. National Politics national politics. That's a central aspect of understanding uh, or the nature of the argument we will make in terms of the focus of analysis, the, the theoretical argument that we put forth, or arguably speculate about more than anything else. But that's uh, uh, something important to note. Okay. Now, when we, when we begin this book and as, as we've worked on it, we, we recognize that there have been several important developments in the U.S. over the last 20, 30, 40 years. Of, uh, however long you want to look back. So, you know, half a, uh, half a century, 40 years, whatever the case might be. One of them that is something that we are all, of course, familiar with, and that is tremendous social and demographic change in the United States, a rather dramatically increasing Latino population, and perhaps equally important, and maybe not as uh, recognized all the time, is the increased importance of black-Latino relations as kind of growing out of that, all right? So, what, what we want to do, what we will do in this is to look at certain features of the American political system, in a sense, uh, this being kind of a, a foundation of what we will look at, but we will also look at, in terms of trying to understand black Latino relations, looking at governmental factors of, of a structural or institutional nature. In a word, federalism. That will be a key part of, uh, of the analysis, part of the argument. Uh, we will also, when I say we, I'm referring to my co-author, that's why I say that so much as well. Uh, there are various other factors that we will consider when we look at, at uh, black Latino relations in national politics. All right. When we think about black Latino relations in American politics, you know, there was a time, there still is an argument out there, and I think it's you know, understandable and, and uh, appropriate and so on, is that there was uh, there had been the argument, particularly in the early 1960s, but into the present as well, that blacks and Latinos might be part of a quote rainbow coalition, a term uh, really uh, highlighted by Jesse Jackson during his presidential run in the 1980s, and uh, others have talked about the notion of a presumed alliance, that is that blacks and Latinos would uh, be kind of natural allies uh, of. Well, <laughs> the assumption, the argument that Latinos and blacks might be natural allies, partly because 
the argument or assumption about having a similar socioeconomic status and related to that, although somewhat distinct, is having similar, somewhat similar uh, historical experiences. And there was no basis for, for kind of thinking in those terms. For example, you know, we, we see here uh, Cesar Chavez and Jesse Jackson in the 1960s, uh, <coughs> one of uh, uh, giving communion, uh, Jackson giving communion here, and there's an implication there of, of a certain degree of connectedness, if you will, around various social and public policy issues. But we know there's other kinds of evidence uh, out there that might suggest something different or otherwise. For example, this. If you recall back to the, uh, to the 2008 presidential election, there was a time relatively early in the presidential election period in the Democratic primaries that, uh, that there was this tension between blacks and Latinos. And one piece of evidence people pointed to was early on it appeared that Latinos were not very supportive of Barack Obama. The kind of argument that some people were making, Sergio Ben Dixon, a, a well-known pollster, but other people as well said, well, blacks and Latinos, people think they, they are, they would be allies, but in fact, there's quite a bit of tension there, and this is indicative of that, that, uh, that, that uh, there's this tension between them and their, the, the relatively low support or enthusiasm for, the, for Obama is indicative of that, right? So, uh, so that argument was made. Now, subsequently, of course, we saw that in the 2008 presidential election. We know Latinos voted pretty heavily for Obama. You know, you would say, okay, big deal, that's not surprising. But part of the argument we want to make uh, in, a, in, a, in a more general sense or more specific sense in certain ways, but uh, the argument we want to make is that it does, this does imply to us uh, kind of initially that the different contexts, the different the different circumstances of the politics have implications for the nature of the group relations. Right. So, uh, what I want to do then is to look at uh, previous political science research that has looked at issues of black Latino relations in the U.S. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time in this because I think part of the, the reason that we undertook this analysis is because we were struck that maybe certain things were being focused upon and certain kinds of questions were kind of being overlooked. So what I'm going to do is go through a fair amount of, of, of previous political science research that addressed uh, these kinds of issues. There's at least two major bodies of research in political science that I think we can point to as, as being important in terms of us thinking about and understanding of uh, black Latino relations. One is the mass attitudes research, mass attitudes. And there's been quite an array of that uh, in political science over the last 10, 15, 20 years or so. One article that I think it's fair to say got a fair amount of attention was one by Paula McLean and others that was published in 2006. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this uh, article that appeared in a journal called Journal of Politics. In any case, the central argument there it was looking at, well, it focused upon the attitudes of, uh, of Latinos in North Carolina, surveys in North Carolina, Latino views and attitudes about blacks. It's a little bit of a complicated story, but in a nutshell, I think one point to take from it is that her argument was there was a lot of uh, de uh, you know, very unflattering views that, that uh, Latinos had of blacks, that they saw them as lazy, uh, not hardworking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you know that argument was uh, that evidence was was fairly strong. Again, a little bit limited in terms of its focus, a particular uh, a particular place, a particular time. Nonetheless, it, it uh, did uh, you know it did uh, bring a fair amount of attention. There have been numerous other studies that I'm just going to note very quickly. And uh, another major study by uh, Oliver, Eric Oliver and Janelle Wong talked about a lot of attitudes uh, between blacks and Latinos in, uh, uh, and they found something interesting and part of the reason I bring attention to this particular piece is that they did find it differences in terms of the social context, although it also brings in a governmental context as well. So they found that the attitudes might vary somewhat in terms of whether you focus within cities or within larger metropolitan areas. So you might find differences in the attitudes just based on that, that social context, which again, they link to cities and, and uh, larger me uh, metro areas. Uh, another uh, study uh, uh, by uh, uh, Helena uh, Rodriguez and Gary Segura in a, an edited book, uh, book edited by Spino, Lee Allen, and Meyer, 
uh, looked at Latino-black relations and, and argues that in certain respects there are certain kinds of circumstances or, or, or factors that would lead us to expect black-Latino uh, positive relations and other circumstances might uh, lead to other kinds of relations. But again, there's a suggestion of kind of variation there. And there have been a variety of kind of assessments or words that people have tried to use to describe black-Latino relations. Uh, one of the terms that's been used, and some of you are probably familiar with this, this word, and I'm not sure I spelled it correctly, but I think I did, <laughs> if I did correct me. Uh, they, they, they were referred to as frenemies, neither friends nor enemies. That, you know, some of both. The evidence seemed to suggest some of both, or it wasn't always clear which was which. All right? So there's a fairly large literature in the uh, mass attitudes research in political science that, again, is suggestive of, of, of hostile or negative views toward each other, although some find positive views, and it, it, it can vary somewhat. Now, I put up this, this long quote here from an, that I draw from a, an article from a Claudine Gay. She uh, published an article in 2006, and it's called Seeing Difference, and I can't recall the full title. But I, I draw out this, this part of, of her uh, discussion toward the end of the book, and I know it's not a good idea to put a bunch of uh, words and, and paragraphs and so on up there. But I try to highlight what I think are the critical points I want you to think about as you look at this. She argues that in her study of black Latino attitudes toward each other's, toward each other, that th we have this image of, based on the, some of the research she points to, of two groups locked in competitive social relations, uh, and and that uh, oftentimes when there are signs of one group doing better than the other, it seems to generate generate fears and hostility. So th that's one kind of finding she identifies from her own. Uh, sur uh, attitude and survey research there. But then she adds, it's also true that the two, the two groups share similar objective circumstances relative to whites, and that's an important uh, point there that perhaps I should have underlined, but they also share similar objective circumstances relative to whites. And she argues that competition and commonality, competition and commonality, may work at cross purposes. Under some circumstances, uh, where we have competition, it would, it would lead us to expect negative attitudes, but where there's a recognition of shared disadvantage, then that might be more likely to move us toward, to move the groups toward greater positive relationships toward one another. All right. she, one of the last things she says is that uh, perhaps social environments influence black attitudes by privileging one uh, fact of black-Latino relations over the other. So she's really focusing more on black attitudes toward toward Latinos, but she's saying, talking about the importance of social environment. All right. Now, so, so we have that kind of literature there, and I will kind of, you know, touch base up with, uh, on that as well later. So we have this one body of research that I've just tried to summarize for you fairly quickly, and that is this body, this mass attitudes research. All right. Now, there's another body of research that, uh, that has looked at urban politics and looked uh, extensively at black Latino relations in urban politics. So there was a study, it's, many of you may be familiar with it, this study by Browning, Marshall, and Tab in the 1980s, which was subsequently kind of used as a template for other research uh, a number of years later. But looking at relationships between blacks, and it really didn't look at black Latino relations actually. Uh, pro, the book, the 1984 book called Protest is Not Enough, really looked at blacks and their abilities and their efforts to kind of become, quote, incorporated into local politics. And it looked at Latinos and their effort to kind of uh, become incorporated in local politics in a number of, of uh, Bay Area cities. But it did emphasize a lot black-Latino relations. It really did, that wasn't really its focus. It was almost like two different analyses, one of blacks, one of Latinos. Although, here and there, here and there, they do mention that, well, the relationships were not necessarily positive toward each other. That to some degree, blacks saw uh, Latinos as kind of riding their coattails. They had done the, he the heavy work, the hard work, and that uh, 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 Latinos were then just kind of benefiting from almost free riding, if you will, uh, from, the, uh, from the efforts of blacks. And therefore, there wasn't necessarily uh, a, a great deal in the way of closeness or cooperation. Again, the, arguably it's, it's more of a, uh, either indifferent or maybe even negative uh, kind of relationship uh, that they had for each other. I think that's fair to say that the story they tell there. There are other uh, st studies of cities such as Miami, among others, where there's 
there was pretty clearly documented hostile relations between blacks and Latinos as well. Uh, and th some other studies have focused on things like voting in city elections. So there was an article uh, by Karen Kaufman a number of, uh, not too many years ago called Cracks in the Rainbow. And I think the title of the, of the article conveys the gist of the argument. If she looks at uh, voting in city elections, and she argues that there are, quote, cracks in the rainbow, the rainbow coalition really isn't there, that indeed there's some negativity toward each other. There was another very recent study uh, of uh, the election of, of the first Latino mayor of Providence, Rhode Island. And, uh, uh, and they uh, assessed this, and the argument is, as well, uh, blacks are rather concerned about the election uh, their voting wasn't particularly supportive of, of the election of a, of a black as mayor of, um, of Providence because blacks were concerned that they, they were not going to be given appropriate attention uh, and so on. There have also been a number of what I, what I call cross-city studies, quantitative studies, that try and say, okay, let's look at a number of cities and see if we can identify patterns in terms of the relationship between them. And, you know, the evidence on this is a little bit varied. But here I mentioned Paula McLean. This is a different article that she did. And uh, in this, she looked at black-Latino relations again, uh, across uh, like 50 cities in the US. And let me just note some of her findings here. She looks at, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a bivariate analysis. It doesn't bring in a lot of variables. So that's one reason to have a little reservation about the findings. But nonetheless, she finds, for example, a negative relationship between the percent Latino population and the representation of blacks on city councils. She finds a negative relationship between the percent black and Latino representation on city councils. She also finds that in cities where you have more Latinos with a college degree, there tends to be less election of black city council members. And various, various indicators, They're not, they don't all point in that direction, but as often as not, I think it's fair to say her data suggests, she says all oh, our findings are mixed, uh, and arguably they, arguably they are, but I think one can, can point to uh, various kinds of uh, ways in which that's not, uh, that there is as much evidence of conflict as there is uh, as, as not. Uh, there are several other studies. Uh, Rene Roach has done some work on school districts. And, you know, there have been some findings there, again, of indicators of tension between them. And then there's been other work that I don't have the, I should have the dates of publication for these, but by Kenneth Meyer and others that have looked at black-Latino relations. Now, one of the things to note in these is, uh, particularly these, these latter two, the one by Rocha and Meyer et al., is that they do find that, that it's not necessarily either conflict or cooperation, that there's other potential relationships, uh, 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 other uh, relationships that, that we will later call uh, independence, and that uh, they, they suggest, well, again, it's possible for groups not to be in cooperating and not in conflict, but kind of, quote, going their own way. They have somewhat different, different kinds of issues and concerns and so on, okay? All right, so we've seen, we've seen some of that. All right, let me th then just uh, suggest to you other data. This isn't an analysis necessarily, per se, but just looking at some data here. If you look at uh, some state-level data regarding black-Latino politics, again, I think it's fair to say that you find some differences in terms of the, uh, the relationships that seem to manifest themselves in terms of, of this. So I have data here on the voting on California ballot measures over a number of years. So we have in 1994 the famous uh, Prop 187, and if you look at the patterns there, there's a pretty big difference between Latino and black voting, a 24% difference uh, in terms of their level of, of, of saying yes to that. Latinos only supported it at 23%, blacks uh, uh, 47%. Also, the vote on official English, there's a pretty big gap between the two groups. If you look at the, the, the uh, uh, ballot measure dealing with limiting bilingual education, <coughs> an 11% difference. Indian busing, uh, back in 1972, there's actually fairly close there. And the anti-affirmative action, as it's referred to in 1996, uh, there was a, you know, a fairly large gap of 19%. Both of them opposed it and white supported it uh, quite strongly. but. Uh, it's not as though they are identical in their levels of support. Uh, all right. So we see some evidence here of kind of, well, they're, they're not entirely in step with each other. There are some differences, and how big those differences are, partly in the eye of the beholder, but I guess I would a, a, a note to you know, give that take on it at this point. But at the same time, if we look at other kinds of evidence that I'm just going to mention quickly, 
Others have argued different kinds of things, but they're looking at different kinds of evidence, and that's important to recognize or keep in mind. So, for example, there was an article, a couple of articles uh, by Rob Freud, my co-author, uh, 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 but in this uh, an article that he did by himself as well as another article with uh, er uh, Eric Junke Gonzalez. In any case, they looked at Latino and black members of state legislatures, and they used these ideology scores. Political scientists would recognize them as kind of a version of DW nominate scores. Uh, in any way, they're measures of general ideology of black and Latino uh, members of, of state legislatures. And overall, uh, that, that analysis tend to find that the ideolo ideological ratings, uh, as summarized in those measures, shows that the, the, vote, the voting patterns of Latinos and blacks are really quite similar. There's another book that came out very recently on Latino members uh, and, rep and representation of state legislatures. And while this is not the core of her analysis, the author of that study, Stella, Stella Bruce, uh, argues that, or makes a claim that black and Latino uh, interests are actually quite similar in nature, and she gives some evidence of that, although that's, again, not the core of, of her argument. All right. So, I've summarized a fair amount of research here, of course. Uh, but, uh, and very quickly, uh, and if, I, if you need me to go back to it at some point, I'd be happy to, to look at it again. But our sense, Rob, and my sense of the relationship is, is the following. When we look at the evidence on black-Latino relations, we're not sure if it's right or wrong. We're, we're not necessarily trying to challenge it in and of itself. We're kind of taking it as, as accurate, as accurate. By and large, it's not, it's not all in the same direction, but the individual pieces and collectively, we, we argue, they're probably, we take them to be accurate. So given that there are these levels, they're fairly common, not always, but fairly common levels of some evidence of conflict and so on, our argument is that, well, those, those findings may be accurate, but do they provide an adequate, an adequate analysis of black-Latino relations? Is there something else going on? Is there some other place we need to look? Well, another thing that we suggest in the <coughs> research is that we think, and there's our, there is already some implication in what I've shown you in terms of those urban level and state level data, is that to some degree the relations may vary by the level of government, local versus state. And we also believe that there, you know, other there may be limitations in the research as well in the on black Latino relations in urban government uh, and, and other ways. But if we look at the research on urban government, again, I've identified a number of circumstances where there seems to be some evidence of, of, of uh, negativity. One of the real problems with that that hasn't really been dealt with, I don't think, in the literature that we kind of deal with indirectly, is that whatever level of, of conflict there is. We, we, we know something's there, but you know, we don't really know how much or how intense. I was telling somebody today, we don't know what the numerator and the denominator is when we try and analyze this. But there is some degree of research that does tell us that there's, that, that there's conflict out there. One of the problems, though, also related to that, in the way that we study this, though, may be that there is a selection bias that some people seem to kind of be picking up on uh, places where there is conflict, and then you say, okay, what is the nature of this conflict, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, there could be zillions of, of uh, times and issues and, and processes and so on where there is no real apparent conflict that are not kind of recognized. So it's, you know, the dog that doesn't bark, in a sense, is, is, is part of an underlying potential dilemma here. Uh, you know, part of our argument in studying what we do is that we also think there are other dogs that aren't barking that haven't been paid attention to. But in, in any case, in any case, that's that's part of our sense of the previous research. Again, it's not we, we, we accept it as accurate by and large, but we're wondering if it's adequate. We do think it suggests variation by level of government, and we also think there's some limitations. We, uh, uh, several other points with regard to the existing research. One is, you know, we think there is considerable evidence of, of competition and conflict in these other analyses. But something else that kind of emerges from these findings, if you read them carefully as we think we have, is that there may be some variation uh, with regard to the, the, the level or the degree of conflict that is affected by the type of issue that's at stake, the type of issue. Our suggestion is that some issues may, may be, well, this is generally you know, understood, is that some issues may be more or less zero-sum in nature. For some policies, you know, we can both 
do fine. We can both win by some definition, or, or maybe my winning doesn't mean you're losing. But if it's more zero-sum in nature, my winning means that you lose or vice versa, that's more zero-sum in nature. And presumably, that's going to have implications for the nature of the relationships, okay? Another point is that I've already hinted at is that, you know, we also think uh, that the research does indicate, and this is a point we, we develop, I think, extensively, is that there are relationships other than just cooperation or conflict that, that can occur. And that would be, you know, kind of a theme that you will see us develop here. Um, and another point that, that I think ultimately is, is, uh, uh, is, uh, is implied in the research, but we try and give it a different emphasis or, or twist, is that policies and politics and intergroup relations may vary by context also. So if you recall my reference to Claudine Gay's uh, comment earlier about the importance of context, you know, context can lead to this or context can shape it in that way. All right. So our suggestion is that we should think of or can think of the level of government as a context. The level of government as a context. So, you know, we can talk about social context, but we also have governmental context in the U.S. associated with the notion, the concept, the structure of American federalism. And I'm going to emphasize that point now. So, when we look at, when we look at our analyses and th that I'm going to present momentarily, is that we, we kind of are influenced by the arguments and, and, and views of other scholars in American politics. Uh, James Madison, who many people argue is very of uh, knowledgeable scholar of American politics, uh, had, had made the argument in, in the Federalist Number 10 in arguing for the nature of the American governmental structure and so on, that it was important to have this, quote, extended republic, an extended republic, uh, having that is this larger geographic uh, uh, arena, if you will, for politics, because that was one of the ways of trying to mitigate the potential negative consequences of faction. So, so having this extended republic was a, a, a pretty important feature in his view of, of, the, of, uh, of dealing with interest groups, if you will, in American society. He also developed that point somewhat in Federalist number 39, but Federalist number 10, he probably makes the argument most directly. Then, a, a well-known political scientist of, of a number of years ago, E. E. Schatzneider, made, uh, wrote this book called The Semi-Sovereign People, and within that, he makes the argument about the importance of the scope of political competition and conflict. That is, uh, the, the nature, be, the relationship between groups competing with each other can vary a lot depending on the scope, a broader scope versus a narrower scope, because it has implications for what other groups, what other coalitions might be formed and so on. And in, in some respects, I guess we think of it as kind of an extension of, of the Madisonian argument about an extended republic. But there's also other more uh, arguable, arguably recent kinds of, of claims that make a similar kind of, of argument. Uh, a well-known book by Paul Peterson called City Limits, that's the title of the book, City Limits, uh, argues that when you look at and try and understand city politics, that they, cities are going to emphasize some policies and de-emphasize others because cities have limits. They have geographic limits, they have policy, uh, authority limits and so on, and that constrains them in certain ways. So, so if you want to understand cities, you need to understand uh, that an important part of understanding cities, city politics and policy, is that they are different in quote their essential character from other governments. Okay, all right. So, we take these arguments and we try and say, okay, we, we Rob and I think one of the implications of this is is the following. Or we're going to this is kind of a a broad working hypothesis here. We, we think that there, there will be variation in the nature of black Latino relationships based on the level of government. We argue, as, as we'll see momentarily, we'll develop further, is that we would expect cooperation or what we more, uh, are, more often argue is non-conflict at the national level. Why? Because we think because of the extended republic, the, the nature of the policies are addressed and so on. We think that ideology is going to play a strong role there, liberal conservative ideology. Whereas at the local level, let's say, interests are going to play a stronger role. So blacks and Latinos may be both relatively liberal, but in the context of the narrower scope of urban politics, uh, there, there may be more interest or uh, a competition 
or kind of fighting over material well-being and so on. So that, that, so that's part of our argument there. So we argue that, that you know, this is not a steadfast rule, but in general we anticipate that there will be differences, uh, that uh, conflict will be, uh, uh, you know, these circumstances will be less common at the local level and more common at the national level. We also argue that in circumstances where you have, uh, uh, you know, where ideology is shared but, and interest competition is not as, as strong or interest of, of potential conflict is not as strong, we think there will be independence. So that's kind of a, another kind of a point that, that we raise. But if you have a, a circumstance where you have both low shared ideology and low shared interests, then you might have conflict. Another way of thinking of these, these categories here, we talk about interest and ideology, but again, to some degree, this kind of coincides with the notion of the extent of zero-sum policies at issue, zero-sum policies. So it, 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 we probably need to have, have stated that more clearly in the book in retrospect. But in any case, uh, that's, that's a point that I would make. So, all right, if that is the case, if what our argument, uh, our general expectation, our general theory, if you will, that, it, that emerges to us in terms of, of what we have. Then the question is, how can we, how should we study this? Is there some way of trying to make sense of it? Is there some way of trying to analyze what we think is, is going on? Right. Well, what is the appropriate or the best evidence to examine these questions? We make some, some choices that we think are good choices but, you know, we've thought about it time here and there. We, we think we might have done more of this, uh, less of that, and so on. Uh, but, but, you know, we say, well, to try and assess this claim, we have to look at, you know, system, some evidence to look at it systematically. All right. Uh, so, so part of what we're going to argue, and let me just clarify this point, is that we're going to look at various uh, evidence at the national level and juxtapose it, not really compare it, but juxtapose it with the local level. And here's what I mean by that. Early on as we were working on this, we said, okay, we're going to look at these policies to study national politics. Some critics said, well, if you're going to compare national and local politics, you have to look at the same policies. So what's going on here and what's going on there? And our argument is that that doesn't make sense. It, because the levels of government are incommensurable in the sense that, yeah, they all have policy, authority, and so on that may intersect, interact, and so on, but the national government has certain power and authority that is fundamentally different than what local governments have. It's, again, uh, Peterson calls it they differ in their essential character. So people say, well, you really can't do this analysis unless you do this, and we said, no, that this is the point. That's actually precisely our point, is that they are different. And therefore, we have to, you know, determine what we think are appropriate and reasonable ways of analyzing uh, evidence at the different levels. So, you know, we made these choices in terms of what to study. You know, I, you know, I'm hope we are certainly open to comments and criticisms later, and we sure will be getting them uh, <laughs> uh, at some point somewhere. Uh, but just to note that, you know, we did face this question. So, what did we think? What did we decide to do? We decided to look at the, the activities of national advocacy groups. National advocacy groups, okay? So we look, for example, at the activities of, of NCLR, National Council of La Raza, and other Latino advocacy groups or interest groups. We also look at the NAACP, represented by Ben Jealous, the current uh, uh, director of, in the NAACP. We also look at the activities of some of the other of black uh, advocacy groups as well. All right. So that's going to be one piece of our analysis. We also look at members of Congress and their behavior. We look primarily at members of the House of Representatives and various dimensions of behaviors in the House of Representatives. All, although part of the way that we look at the behavior of members of Congress uh, is through the lens of the advocacy groups. The advocacy groups say, we think these are important issues, and then we say, well, the advocacy, advocacy groups say that. Well, let's look at some of those policies as they play out in, in, in the Congress. So what you have here, and this is actually the cover of our book, is, is the, uh, you have the three people who were, who were heads of the, uh, the three minority cau uh, caucuses in Congress. Barbara Lee, which, who I assume is familiar to just about everybody in this room. Uh, Nidia Velasquez uh, from New York, who was the, uh, the head of the uh, Hispanic Caucus at the time. And Judy Chu, who was head of the uh, Asian Caucus at that time. 
Uh, our focus is here, but I think it's interesting that this picture also brings that in because that's something that we think might be a developing issue in the future uh, worth looking at. So again, we look at, at national advocacy groups, we look at these, uh, these other uh, the members of Congress and their behavior, and then we look to some degree at the intersection of those. All right, what do we look at? I'm going to go through this quickly. We, we do focus, and this is an important point that probably has, has already uh, occurred to you, we do look at, at advocacy groups and members of Congress. We are emphasizing, we acknowledge, elite behavior. If we think of elected officials as, quote, elites of a sort, then yes, we're looking at that. And it's important to recognize that, of course, because to some degree, it does appear that we find differences in the relationships based on whether we look at the elite level and the mass level. They're both very important. We don't deny the importance of the, of the mass level. But part of what we're trying to say is that we're going to look at the national level and, and almost of necessity that leads us to really focus upon elite behavior, that is uh, the advocacy organizations and the members of Congress. So we look at uh, black and Latino uh, advocacy organizations such as NAACP, NCLR, MALDEF, and so on. We also look at, at the data with regard to their involvement in congressional testimony and their uh, involvement in the legal arena, particularly the courts, particularly the, uh, the filing of amicus groups. We also, and I'm going to go through the kinds of data and then go pretty quickly through the actual uh, uh, data itself. Another set of things that we look at is the scorecards of the various groups. Many of you may be familiar that there are a number of, of groups out there who do these scores or, or attribute or create scorecards for members of Congress in terms of how they vote on certain issues. So the American for Democratic Action for many years was a pretty visible one. You have all kinds of interest groups and, and so on that have these. Well, black and Latino groups created those and have used those as well. And we use those because uh, we think that they are appropriate particularly to our concerns. And let me just say something about that momentarily. Or, or, or right now, and, th and that is the following, is that one of the criticisms that, that we've received uh, from, from people who read our stuff is that why didn't we just use so what are called these DW nominate scores? Well, if you're not familiar with them, I think I'll try and summarize very quickly. Basically, DW nom nominate scores really focus on just about every vote that's very competitive. And we think that's important. Indeed, there's a chapter in the book that we focus on that a great deal, although I'm not going to talk about that today. But some people say, why don't you use that if you're trying to compare the groups and so on? Well, our argument is that our focus here is really on black and Latino groups. And we want to focus on the issues that are defined as important by those groups. That has certain benefits we have, although arguably it has some limitations as well. But we do that, but we don't ignore the nominate scores entirely. We do that in another part of the analysis that I will not discuss today for lack of time, which I'm seeing as more pressing than I had anticipated, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so we, so we, look, we look at that, and what we will look at is what we call the policy salience and congruence. Basically, we'll be looking at the extent to which the, the, the various groups identify the same issues as important, that is salient, and secondly, whether or not they agree on the issues. Congruence, what we would call congruence, okay? All right, so let, and then we also look at uh, blacks and Latinos voting in, in, the, in the House of Representatives, and we'll look at a couple of questions here. We also have several kind of case studies kind of stuff that I will mention momentarily. All right, let me then kind of uh, go into uh, some of the analysis. All right, again, here when we look at the advocacy groups, uh, we look at amicus briefs, and what do the two groups file on, and do they file on the same side, okay? Do they, do, what, do they, what are the cases that they think are important? And then if, if they file a brief, do they file on the same side, or are they both against it, both for it? Okay, is what we're trying to say. We also look at congressional testimony. All right. Now, this is going to be a really quick a, a, a summary of what happens with regard to the amicus briefs. We find that there's only a moderate, modest degree of overlap in the filing of briefs. That is, they don't necessarily file briefs on the same cases. It's much less than what you might expect. I don't. I should have the the, the basic percent there, but I, but I don't. But it's quite small actually. And, um, and occasionally, they will, they will uh, file together. There are some cases when they, when they both are interested in a case that they will file together. And we undertake a fairly extensive analysis of that in the book, including some kind of case studies on so what we think are some major cases and so on. 
but basically, you know, the kind of core point to think about here that I would, I would ask you to think about here is that there's a modest, modest degree of overlap in, in what they file, uh, and there are some joint filings. But when they do file on a case, when both of them file on a case, either separately or together, if they're together, they're obviously on the same side. But if they both file on the same case, they're always on the same side. We found no example using data from the 1970s to 2000. There's this uh, uh, database, uh, Harold Spade, the political scientist, has created this database of, 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 of court decisions and so on. So we, what we did was we looked at, at the, uh, a number, you know, basically the, the, the cases filed during that time and looked at to what extent did blacks and Latinos file uh, amicus briefs and if they did, again, were they on the same side? Did they, did they file the same cases on the same side? They file the same cases somewhat, but not a lot. But when they do file, they're always on the same side. We found no instances where they did not file on the same side. Okay? Uh, we also look at congressional testimony. And we have acted quite a number of different charts and tables and so on to summarize the data. We have descriptive data mostly that we looked a little bit at you know levels of significance and so on, but I want what I want to indicate to you here is some of the uh, uh, you know for looking again at data from about 1970 to, to 2000, and uh, the kinds of things that they that they presented congressional testimony about. We have ethnic racial group discrimination issues, civil rights issues, and so on. Now there's one thing to note about well at least one thing to note I guess I should say about congressional testimony. When you look at congressional testimony, you need to be careful because, in a sense, uh, the uh, the advocacy groups don't think don't they don't say, "Oh, we want to uh, testify." They may want to, but in a sense, they have to be invited, or the congressional committee needs to say, "Yes, you can testify. You can testify." Now they tend to say, "You say these kinds of issues." Oh, yeah, we're probably going to ask these groups. Yeah, we're going to probably ask those groups, but it's not entirely self-initiated. So that's a little bit of a caveat to keep in mind. But what we look at is. To what extent we, uh, there, is, there is similarity, overlap, or difference here? I guess I would ask you to focus mostly on this purple column, or blue, depending on how good your, what your eyesight tells you. Uh, mine tells me it's somewhere in between, actually. Um, in any case, if you look at uh, the areas, and again, this is using a, a typology of, of the policies by the people who created this massive database of congressional uh, of, of policy is that they, uh, if you look at the areas where there's the most degree of, of testimony by black and Latino groups, it tends to be general civil rights and voting rights issues, okay? May, maybe not surprising at all, but there is that. But what's interesting is though there are other areas where you do see the groups are not, are, are filing on different kinds of issues. Again, we don't think that's entirely surprising, but we, we don't think that people necessarily looked at this and, and uh, and uh, thought about it enough. So, in any case, you find that here we find uh, blacks tend to emphasize these kinds of cases, although they also overlap there. But then there are other areas where we see where Latinos are uh, do give extra attention, if you will, issues of the census, perhaps not surprising, as well as immigration and refugee issues. So we do see that they they're kind of you know there's some uh, higher overlap on some issues. And, uh, and then in other areas, you find that there's a little bit more what you might call specialization, if you will. You know, these issues are important to this group, these issues are important to that group. They don't, you know, they're not fighting with each other, it's just that, you know, they, they have different levels of intensity or concern with regard to those issues, all right? So, what do we conclude then with regard to that first piece of evidence, that is, the, the behavior of the advocacy groups with regard to amicus briefs and congressional testimony? Based on our, what, we, what we looked at, we find no evidence of conflict or contradictory behavior. We, you know, again, we, look at, we couldn't find any congressional testimony or amicus briefs where there was any much evidence, if any, that indicated some degree of conflict. Right. Uh, overall, we think there's as much evidence of independence or going their own way. So it's not competition, it's not conflict. There's as much independence or going their own way as, as uh, as, as anything, all right? So that's one kind of, uh, of evidence that we look at. Then we look at another that I've already mentioned, uh, and so I'll, I'll go to that one next. We look next, again, at policy, what we call policy salience and policy congruence. Here the question again is that do the advocacy groups identify the same issues? 
And if, to the extent they identify the same issues, do they take the same position on those issues? Okay. Now here we have a quick little table that summarizes this. Here we have the, end, the, end, uh, the National Hispanic Leadership Association, which created these uh, scorecards over a period of time. We have the NAACP, because they're the ones who actually uh, had scorecards over this period. And we have data from the 105th to the 108th Congress. Uh, you know, one of the things we, we, we want to do probably in future research is to ex extend the time period and see if we find the same kinds of things that we find here. In any case, so what the, the, the way to read this table is this. In, in, for the 105th Congress, the uh, National Hispanic uh, uh, Leadership Association identified 33 bills or 33 votes in Congress. The NAACP identified 23. Now, of those, those two there, the 33 and the 23, they only overlapped on seven. Only seven of those issues did they, did they say, yes, this is part of our scorecard. Okay? Uh, and you know the same thing for the so in, in the uh, 106 Congress 36 and 30 and six. So what you find here, if you look at this, the bottom there where it's uh, total where it says in, in purple, uh, there were 28 instances in which they overlapped, which only comprised about 22 percent of the of the votes identified by the National Hispanic Leadership Association on their scorecards, and about 17 percent of those uh, on the black scorecards. So you know so roughly 20 some percent or so, do they overlap? So, you know, we take that not to be particularly high. You know, it's, I think some people might have the assumption that they're going to have much higher degree of identifying <coughs> the same issues. Well, it's relatively low, we think. Uh, part of the issue we run into is we're not sure what our baseline or point of reference should be. Uh, that's something that we need to think about further. But then the next column we think is equally interesting or, in, uh, uh, as well, and that is this. So we've identified the issues on which they do overlap. Then the question is, to the extent that they, they do <coughs> overlap, they share the same concern, to what extent do they agree on what the vote should be? Should you vote? Is, is the right vote, quote, a right vote, the yes vote or the no vote by a member of Congress? All right. What we find here is that they overlap on seven, and they agree on all seven. They overlap on six, they agree. The bottom line in the bottom right corner is that we identified 28, and in every instance, they were on the same side, OK? So <coughs> what, what do these advocacy groups identify as important issues? <coughs> the ones. How much do they overlap? Modestly. Do they agree on those? Totally. So again, we take this to be a sign, certainly not of evidence of conflict. We can't really tell you it's cooperation, I don't think, because to say it's cooperation implies a certain degree of kind of coordination <coughs> or, and or uh, talking to each other, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that may occur. But one of the limitations I would, I, I, I would acknowledge of our analysis, it doesn't really allow us to, and, uh, to look at that. Now, other people are doing that kind of research, and we're going to draw that in more to our, some of our work. Right. So that's what we find with regard to uh, so again, the, the, the two major points to take away from this is that we have a low, low shared salience and very high, indeed, uh, complete congruence. All right. Then we turn our analysis to, of the behavior of members of the House of Representatives on various kinds of things. We have Lucille uh, Royball Allard here, uh, indicative of the uh, Latino members of Congress, and uh, John Lewis, uh, indicative of the uh, black members of Congress. And here's what we do in this. We look at the, uh, how black and Latino MCs, members of Congress, vote on the, in, in the House on those scorecards. So we don't say how they vote in general or, or uh, nominate scores, although again, we look at that in a separate chapter. Uh, but we look at how they vote on those scorecards. Our argument is that, well, these advocacy groups identify these as, as the, the most important issues, so let's take those as what we will study. Basically, just to give you a very quick sense of this, and there's some a little bit of peculiar findings here, but here's what we find. We have data for different Congresses from the 104th Congress to the 108th Congress, so there's five Congresses for which we have the data. And what we have is data on how black Democrats voted on Latino Democrats, white Democrats, BR means black Republicans, LR means Latino Republicans, WR means white Republicans. Kind of like the mean score for each of those groups, okay? And what you find, you know, some of this is not surprising, perhaps, but the, and this is the extent to which they, they score more highly on the NAACP scorecard.
Uh, and we find that you know black Democrats are very, very high toward the top, but not always 100% by any means. Latino Democrats tend to be pretty high as well, and white Democrats uh, are, are tend to be high. Uh, as you would expect, it's partly a part of party kind of thing that Republicans tend to be lower. Although there's one or two instances that are kind of interesting here in, in one Congress 106, the Latino uh, uh, Rep Republicans three from the Miami area basically actually score score somewhat highly there. Then there's actually a Congress here where there were no black Republicans. It was one. You know, the data for the black Republicans is a little bit limited because they, weren't, they just aren't there. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so that's not our fault. Probably in terms of the data we like that. Uh, then, if we look at this from the National Hispanic Leadership Association, again, we look at uh, the patterns here. Interestingly, a couple of times, black Democrats have higher scores than Latino Democrats, which, you know, we're, we're still a bit puzzled about what to make of that. It, it could be that maybe what, what one of the, the comments people have made is that you're, you're basically just saying that uh, this is just a measure of liberalness and it's not that different from other, other measures of ideology or liberalness and so on. Well, maybe, but. Actually, again, this other chapter, which I keep referring to, leads us to think something different, but I, I will just set that aside for the moment. But here's what we see in general. All right, so then we do an analysis, a regression analysis, that I'm not going to present to you because those, those tables are here, at least for me, my eyes glaze over when I see those things. But, but in the table, what we try and look for is whether we see evidence of conflict, whether descriptive representation, that is, whether a person is a black or a Latino, leads them to, to kind of vote in ways that seems not only more supportive of their own, quote, own group, but the other group, Latinos, are blacks. And third, the degree to which uh, uh, descriptive representation and other factors influence voting. All right, very quickly, these are kind of our expectations, our kind of theoretical expectations, or what we would take of it as evidence to suggest conflict, competition, or something else. So, if you're a black representative, we would, of course, expect a positive vote, a, a strong positive correlation with your vote on the NAACP. But if you're a black representative and you also have a pretty strong positive relationship with the NA, NHLA score, that suggests that we think of at least non-cooperation, non-conflict, but perhaps a cooperation as well. With regard, uh, with regard to a black representative, if they vote positively on the NAACP, and has no effect on the NHLA, we would say that's an uh, 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 indicator of independence, not uh, co-op support or. And then here, if, if a black representative has a negative score, again, controlling for a variety of other factors. And we have basically the same thing with uh, parallel points with regard to black representatives. And then we do an analysis as well where we look at the percent black of the black population and the percent of the Latino population in the district uh, because you know, that may be another factor at work there. So we have these various iterations, which again I, I'm not able to develop further uh, for the moment. But basically, then you know, when we do the analysis, what do we? What are the basic findings that we come to? One, we find no evidence of conflict. That is, we don't find black representatives having a negative score on the NHLA scores, or Latino representatives having a negative score on on the black scores. You might say, well, big deal. So what? Well. We do find conflict at other levels of government in manifest in various ways. So if, if relationships were the same everywhere, we might say we would expect that. But here also. But we don't. We don't find that. All right. So we find no, no evidence of conflict. What else do we find, though? We do find that to a modest degree, and this is mostly black members of Congress, that their, their support for Latino of, 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 of concerns, or for the Latino scorecard, is, 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 is fairly strong beyond what you would expect based on other factors alone. It's not quite as clear with regard to Latino members of Congress. It is the case that the strongest uh, variable is the person's party affiliation. That's, again, that's not surprising. So part of our argument, though, let me just emphasize this, is that party affiliation and partisanship mean something different and we think more important in terms of national politics than it does in local politics. Local politics uh, party party uh, impacts can be very, very different. Another thing that we find is that district racial ethnic composition actually has relatively little independent in fact, uh, impacts with one, with one exception. And that is we do find that if you just look at black population, that the, there is a little bit of negative, negative relationship with the NHLA score. So not for black representatives, but if you look at the percent black in the district, there's a little bit of a negative relationship sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, 
socioeconomic attributes, uh, levels of income, education, and so on, don't have much impact. So what does all this evidence tell us? Well, we see little or, or no evidence of conflict, mostly independence. Uh, although we would, uh, we would emphasize that the absence of conflict does not equal of coalition activity or cooperation necessarily, although in some cases we think there is evidence of that, but we generally cannot make the argument very much beyond that. And we think these findings are even more notable because I didn't emphasize this, but I hope it was apparent from the tables, is that the length of the period that we studied for both the, for the various kinds of data is fairly long, certainly I think it's fair to say longer than a lot of other analyses of roughly similar kinds of issues. Uh, and we also think there's consistency across the, the types of analysis. Uh, uh, what are the implications of this? Uh, we think when something is very important is where do you what you find depends uh, at least partly on where you look and how you look. If you look for black Latino relations in the urban level, you're more likely to find something. If you look at the national level, we think you might find something else. And we do, we do find no evidence of conflict. And we think that's, again, our, our, due to this you know, different nature of policies, less, uh, uh, less zero-sum in nature, so on, linked to, linked to federalism. We do think uh, social and governmental institutions and context matters, that in intergroup relations are affected by institutional uh, and policy context, and probably differs if you look at mass repeat data. And, uh, you know, we think this also has implications for American social and political pluralism, uh, how, these, how blacks and Latinos are going to be more or less important in American politics over the next uh, decade or so, or, or well beyond that. Again, what we make, and, and let me just kind of end my comments with this, is in many respects what we're making is essentially an institutional argument about black Latino relations. <coughs> institutional, that is, if you look at federalism as an institution, we think that you know, the, the, the way that federalism in the U.S. structures the, the role, the authority, the, the types of policies that different governments have, that, play, that has an impact whether, uh, where policies are more, the, that are dealt with at different levels or are more or less to, uh, likely to be zero-sum in nature, at least with regard to black and Latinos relative to whites. At the local level, it's somewhat different, and that's part of the argument. Okay. So, I, should say, I was going to say in a nutshell, but that would be totally absurd. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, in essence, in essence, uh, uh, I have I have what we think is a great quote here that I think summarizes. But I'll save that for now. So, that's the presentation. Okay. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa was right, I owe her. So she told me, you're wrong, you're going to go away over. I said, no, no, no. <laughs> Thank you for that. So listen to her. Sorry. Yeah. yeah it's for students, if you have 35 slides, you cannot give them in 40 minutes. Just, just say. It's <laughs> not possible. Do I recognize people raising their hands? Yeah, do you mind? Know. Just because I'm kind of in a spot. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, if you don't yeah. mind. Yeah, Laura. <coughs> so, do you have any evidence or just thoughts about this independence phenomenon, how much, let's say from the, from the organizational standpoint, it's tied to organizational inheritance. I have in the yeah, back yeah, of my yeah. mind a book, a recent book by Matt Grossman, who says that organizations well, I, I both survive the yeah, yeah. and thrive and succeed only if they specialize. Right, right. They are known as the rep as the organization that serves the <coughs> constituent, not the constituent. Right. So I, have, I can imagine it becomes problematic yeah. for the organization to do too much collaboration, if, you know, from if yeah. grossman. Yeah, yeah. No, very good point. In fact, uh, Laura, I uh, this is my colleague Laura Stoker from Political Science. If you don't know it. Wonderful person, and I'm saying not, not to soften up my, her, her, her challenging me, but um, another question. Uh, but, uh, but no, actually, I, I heard about Grossman's book, and I actually called him on the phone, and we spoke on the phone about this very question, and I said, you know, there was some 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 development a while back. What was it? Uh, where? Oh, it, yeah, I think it was the SB 1070 issue in Arizona, and in terms of some of the filings of, of briefs on that that uh, blacks had not filed briefs on that. And I said, well, you know, does this surprise you? And he said, no, no. Basically, you know, these organizations have to make choices about their resource, they, you know, resource limitations, <coughs> and relate to that the likelihood of, of emphasizing or specializing on certain kinds of issues and not others. So I think 
so, so my sense is, in fact, we have a part of a, a, a chat, part of our discussion, part of the book. We make that point early on in the book. We say, you know, part of what may be going on here are these kinds of things. And we think that's an additional factor that, you know, we only have so many resources. But we also think that that, that the absence of conflict is, is kind of facilitated by, interestingly, the lack of resources with regard to the organization. But it also does differ by levels of governance, where at, at, the, at the local level, it's, it's it's to some degree the kinds of issues that, that are oftentimes really important to minority groups really transcend the local level and is more focused on, on interest. And so I'm not sure that answers your question very well, but, but I, I, we are aware of and sensitive to we actually have this argument. You know, he makes that argument, and you may have seen some of the work of Gray and Lau that talk about you know, that, that groups, uh, various groups have create their niches or have niches, and again, not unlimited resources. Uh, some issues are more directly important and salient or to them. And so it's not altogether surprising that they would be going their own way. But I think what, what, you know, what we find is evidence that's compatible with that. But again, we also kind of juxtapose it to what seems to be found at the urban level of, of research. There's not always, but there's you know, fair, fair degree of evidence of conflict. Again, we're really uncertain. You know, it's, people in the literature make a, a, lot, a big deal of, of the evidence of conflict. We kind of use that to our advantage in the sense to say, look, we found something really different here. But again, we're not, yes, there, there's conflict, but if you, what, you know, what, what would be the appropriate numerator and denominator, whatever, to figure out how much there is? I'm not sure what that would be. There's so many cities, so many policies, so many issues. So, so it's really hard to, to, uh, to, to come up with any clear cut point with regard to what the situation is at the urban level. But we say, if there is some evidence of this kind of conflict, with, but at least some frequency, do we find the same thing at the national level? We don't, looking at these kinds of evidence. And again, we, we speculate more than anything else that we think is this scope of conflict or sphere or, or you know, different policies and so on. Okay? Yeah? So awesome. thank you for the wonderful presentation. I was thank wondering you. if you can talk more about the rationale behind using uh, members of Congress, the, the voting record, as part of the analysis. I think it's, it's pretty clear why you, you would use the national advocacy organizations because they're supposed to represent the interests of, of these racial groups. Uh, so I wonder, is the, same, is the same expectation also placed on the members of Congress in that because they are black representative yeah. or Latino representative that they are going to vote <coughs> according to perhaps their race or, or is it, are, are they voting based on their, the demographics of their constituents? Yeah, I mean, Basically, there, there is this pretty large literature, very large, perhaps not surprising, the kinds of issues that they, they sponsor and co-sponsor <coughs> is, is somewhat different than, than others. And that's been identified also in some of the state legislature, uh, state legislative research. Uh, but no, I, I, do, I know, and your point very well taken in that regard, as many of you may know, or most of you may know, that one of the criticisms, and legitimate, I think, of looking at how people vote on issues in Congress is that they vote on the issues that are up for vote in Congress. But, you know, what are the, uh, how about the issues that don't make it onto the agenda? There could be something really important that doesn't make it far enough to ever really get to a committee vote, much less a floor vote, and so on. So that, to me, and, and there are a couple of people doing research in that area, and they do argue that the, the degree of, uh, of uh, uh, sponsorship and co-sponsorship, the level and the nature does differ for black, for black members. Michael Mint is working on what he's seen that. So anyway, yeah, yes? So uh, your research focuses very much on, on how elected officials in both of these communities work with each other or you know independent of each other. I'm wondering if through your research or you, you looked at how communities outside of, outside of elected officials, how communities in neighborhoods and cities yeah. are working in collaboration or in independence with each other. No, I mean, arguably that's a limitation of our study. We're, we're really looking at elite level behavior, that is what advocacy groups and members of Congress at the national level within the, the governmental processes that we typically, that are often focused upon. Uh, which is not to say that's all there is about politics by any stretch of the imagination. We can talk about, again, mass attitudes, we can talk about activities in urban government, we can talk about you know community organizations and so on. That's not really uh, included in this study for better or worse, probably for worse more than better. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Um, so 
just a couple of things that I mean, I, I appreciate the limitations of, of reviewing how to measure and really do what you guys do as social scientists. And I think that anecdotally uh, and qualitatively, I don't know how you get to um, what I know to be a fact, which is behind the scenes, mm -hmm. behind the scenes, there is a lot of push, yeah. even at the elite level. Yeah. So yeah. the examples would be um, the increase in budget in Head Start in the, in the 90s, uh -huh. real uh, negotiations because of who the Head Start providers were right. versus who the new population and right. sort of the only way to do it would be to add new money and right. not take away. Right. Or um, budget negotiations over HBCUs versus eight, you know yeah. uh, Hispanic right. serving. Right. Or on immigration, the fact that at the national level, when we were in the middle of immigration coalition building, at the national level, people didn't even want to talk about the Black Latino conflict right. that people sensed at yeah. the local level. Yeah. Right. But yeah. finally, reaching a point that in order to kind of move the agenda forward. There had to be a discussion. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, or the fact that on voluntary national standards for for schools in the 90s, it was black and Latino members of Congress voting with Republicans who defeated Clinton's mm -hmm. effort. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I think this this is hugely important yeah. to look at this. But I, I, I just I don't know how to get and what value it would add. But no, I think it, well, let me say, I think it would add tremendous value, add tremendous value. But I do think, you know, there are ways of, you know, interviewing people from, I mean, you know, one of the chapters that we had is kind of, oops, I can turn that back on. Uh, one of the chapters we have has several kinds of, quote, case studies. They're not really case studies, they're just illustrations here and there. And we look at things like no child left behind, welfare reform, voting rights renewal, immigration, and others. And the data that we use here, Maria, which is, not adequate, I agree. But we do things, we look at like the website <coughs> of, of the caucuses. Mm -hmm. We look at some of the statements of black members of Congress, of Latino members of Congress. Uh, we look at the, the, the websites and the, and the public statements of the advocacy organizations. And in looking at those, by and large, at least what they're saying publicly, and we know that you know, this, this, is, this is part of the story, but it's not the whole story. But what they say with regard to virtually all those issues is, you know, either they don't talk much about the other one, or they, they say something that's at least in a, in a fairly general kind of way supportive of, of, of the other uh, in, in interesting kinds of ways. I mean, so for example, when we looked at the, uh, uh, the Black uh, uh, Caucus and other, some of the Black members of Congress, their websites, you know, they would use the phrase, which, you know, we know could be interpreted very, and remember our data are from a while back, but they would talk constantly about comprehensive uh, immigration reform, which, you know, for many people is kind of a code word of a, including certain kinds of things which may not be uh, open. But your point is, well, take, I mean, one way just would be to identify what are, you know, thought to be some of the more critical issues of the sort that you, that you identify. Maybe that would be an approach is that somebody like me goes to somebody who's been, quote, inside a lot and say, well, tell me about it. What are the major issues that, that have had that, that kind of required negotiation and so on? But one of the things I guess I would suggest to you is that the, the fact that there is that negotiation is itself indicative right, of right. something. Yes. See, the argument that we would make would be that if you look at the local level, you, don't, you either don't have the elites or you don't have the policy space, the policy flexibility, if you will, to do some of those things. So, it, so the, 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 greater imp, uh, the greater impact of kind of the uh, you know, quote, material interest more directly at the local level is not felt in the same way to the same degree at, at the national level. So, so. Uh, and I guess I would just look to the agenda setting. It is noteworthy that, for example, the tri caucus. Yeah, yeah. That's so recent. Yeah. That literally, you know, people are going, oh my goodness, why didn't these three minority caucuses? actually try to develop an agenda yeah. going and forward. And they are now, apparently. Yes, you know, so how, how well that's going, I don't really know. But but like I said, I mean, it just so happened that we, you know, when we were looking at the book, we came across this picture, and we said, well, you know, that's that's really cool that we have, uh, you know, uh, have them all in one picture. And interestingly, at the time, they were all women. Uh, so. Sorry.
So I have two housekeeping, quick housekeeping things. If you're here and getting extra credit from a professor, please write down your faculty member's name next to your sign-in name so that we know who you are and we can make sure you get credit. Secondly, I'd like to invite everyone to join us for a reception in the parlor um, from Lebanon. We have wonderful cooking stuff and great food if you want to come and keep talking. And then lastly, please join me in thanking Rodney for a wonderful